같아. absolutely smashing my stick insect outfit. I can't believe how hard I've succeeded this week. Oh, well, hello, there's people here, brilliant. Should we just get going? I think we should just do it. I think we should do it right now. Let's do it. Oh, God, so 
proud of this. Ugh, the work that's gone into this costume. <sighs> okay, yeah, there's no point of having around. There's people here, I'm here. You've got all the bits that you need, you've got your things, your four teaspoons, your six food cans, your grain of rice, or if not that, a cumin seed, brown pen, piece of privet, privet hedge, if you've got any privet hedge nearby. And have you thought about why on earth you need those things? Mm. Okay, right, I'm flipping you around. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> do, 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 do. <laughs> Hello! Hello, Science Alliance! Hello, come on. Yeah, I mean, we've seen some costumes on Theatre Science, but surely, admit it, this is the best thing I've ever done. I'm a bit worried that I'm not going to get the full... I have to sit a bit further back. Hello, everyone. My name is Lara. This is Theatre of Science. I actually, I am trained to teach physics to A-level. I actually do very proper, challenging, robust, uh, all-ages home ed science lessons. For free, there are printouts. I ask you questions, you answer them. This is not that. This is the show with the Lego story time at the end where I just tell you everything I learned about a thing this week. And this week, I've been learning about stick insects. I didn't know anything about them. I'm not a massive fan of pets. Um, but, you know, I have to admit it, they absolutely rock. I know there are some stick insects watching, so hello. First of all, let's talk about what is an insect. PowerPoint time. So we have talked about this in the theatre of science before, properly, how all life on Earth, uh, scientists have split it up into bits. So the bit that's always at the top, the top category, is usually the kingdom. So there's the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the fungus kingdom. Stick insects, obviously, in the, they are animals. They're in the animal kingdom. Animals are a bit vague, though, isn't it? So we split animals up into different categories called phylums. And stick insects are arthropods. That's all the animals with no backbone. A skeleton on the outside of their body, the exoskeleton, and their legs have got joints. But again, there's a lot of different arthropods, so we put them into different classes, and one of those classes is insects. Insects have got three pairs of legs, a three-part body, and compound eyes. I'm going to tell you about why compound eyes have totally blown my mind this week in a sec. Um, but obviously, yeah, insects are split into different categories, and one of the categories is, with apologies to anyone who knows anything about Latin, Phasmatodea. Phasmatodea, um, which is the stick insect order. Right. So, yeah, compound eyes. I almost didn't want to tell you this because I've been so inspired. I think I'm going to write a supporter magazine on bugs and put this in there. But I have to tell you about compound eyes. It's too cool. Compound eyes are those insect eyes, you know, like that bees have. You've seen them, those big bulgy eyes. And instead of being like one eye, it's loads and loads and loads of little eyes kind of all together so you've seen it right we all know like that weird vision that insects have where it's just loads and loads of images really small in a circle why is that a good thing like why would any creature want that it's really blurry like fairly obviously it, their, their vision is quite blurry the reason it's good for them it's partly because uh, their eyes, these compound eyes, insect eyes, are really bulging out. So if, if you look straight ahead right now, if you keep your eyes forward, you can't really, humans can't really see that much to the sides, can you? You can't really see what's behind you. That's fine for you, because there's not usually anything around trying to swat you or whatever, but insects have got a lot of predators, so they have to be able to see sort of behind them as well as in front of them at all times. So that's one of the things that compound eyes do. But the other thing, is this thing called flicker rate. So, you know, like if you're using, say, a flick book, say, um, then if you flick up some pictures slowly, it's just like image, image, image. But if you flick it really quickly, then your brain sort of, it looks like your brain kind of can't keep up and it looks like it's moving. That is because humans have got a, like a flicker rate, I'm calling it, of about 60 images per second. So if we see 40 images per second, we're just like, pff, image, 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 this is just images. If we see 60 images per second, we're like, whoa, it's moving. So your, your flicker rate is like the point when that happens. And these compound eyes on insects mean that their flicker rate is loads higher than ours. It's, which is why it's impossible to swat flies. Not that anyone should ever do that, because all life is precious. But if you do try and swat a fly, it feels like you're going at the speed of light. But what the insect is just seeing is like hand, hand hand, hand, because they can just process much, much quicker, yeah, quicker flicker rate. So that was compound eyes. Okay, I think we should do, we should do an activity, because I asked you to bring some things, and they all have something to do 
with what I want to explain to you about stick insects. I asked you to bring some grains of rice. Uh, if you haven't got those, I said cumin seeds or some sort of little seed. I asked you to bring some privet. How does that relate to stick insects? It's kind of the easy one. Four teaspoons. Uh, and I asked you to bring six cans of food as well. I'm just going to hold up three, but I have six here. What does that have to do with stick insects? Well, first of all, I have an impossible task for you. If you have got some white rice, our f I was going to say our first activity, our only activity, this is the best you get of the science today, is colour in a piece of rice brown. It's impossible. It's the most boring and the least possible thing we've ever done on a show ever. Because the rice is tiny, so you keep dropping it, and as soon as you colour in a bit, then you've got to hold it to colour in the other end. And then you go, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this impossible task of colouring in a single piece of rice brown? What does this have to do with stick insects? What is this representing about the stick insect? Don't say poo, it's not poo. So people, when I did this on the Facebook uh, Live, where there were comments, uh, were saying, like, camouflage, well done, but what are we camouflaging? What are the stick insects camouflaging? Yes, themselves, yes, but this piece of rice does not represent a stick insect. It represents... Anyone got it? Uh, I'll show you, I'll show you. Yeah, I organised the PowerPoint for this as well. It, it looks like an egg. A stick insect egg, because a lot of stick insect eggs look like seeds. Aren't these gorgeous? These are not seeds. These are stick insect eggs. Look, they've even got the little nubbly bit at the top that, that seeds have. Isn't that cute? Um, why do stick insect eggs look like seeds? Well, um, it turns out stick insects, uh, as far as humans' standards go, are not very good parents. So stick this 3,000 different species of stick insects on planet Earth. Most of them live in the tropics, right? Like the rainforest. They live in the trees, and when they lay eggs, the eggs just fall, just fall to the ground, and the little baby stick insects just have to make their way in the world. But this is actually a better idea than it sounds, um, because if you're a predator looking for eggs to eat, well, I've done you. I've, I've mocked up with my incredible uh, skills here an image of some stick insect eggs on a leaf or on a rainforest floor as a predator, like a bird or something, which one looks tastier? Yeah, definitely the one where all the eggs are gathered together, right? So laying them all carefully in a group on a plant would probably increase the chances of them all getting eaten. Whereas this way, if they're all disguised on the floor, there's, there's much less chance of them getting eaten. I did read also um, that they, they have like little fatty stores in their eggs, which ants really like to eat. So ants carry the eggs back to their nests. This is totally true. Eat the little fatty store, and with the rest of the egg, they're like, ugh, don't want that bit, and throw it away. But the little baby stick insects, like, then hatches from that bit, and it's, it's I was gonna say, it's downstairs. It's underground in the ant's nest, so it's all safe, because ants don't eat baby stick insects. It's got time to like mature before it pops up onto the, uh, onto the ground. Okay, right. Um, what should we talk about now? Uh, oh, let's, yeah, let, okay, let's get the other, the other props done. So privet, you probably guessed the reason that I said to bring some privet is because uh, some stick insects really like to eat privet. Most of the ones that we keep as pets in the UK, they just dig it. I cannot find out on the internet what it is about privet that they like. Uh, the flowers and seeds of privet are actually very toxic to humans, so don't you go eating it. But yeah, insects love it. Um, stick insects like privet and uh, blackberry as well. So that was what the privet was for. Oh, get your spoons! So I said to bring three or four teaspoons. Um, <clears throat> the heaviest stick insect ever recorded weighed 65 grams. 65 grams. I've got very precise scales in my house and I worked out that the weight of one teaspoon is pretty much on average about 20 grams, maybe just over 20 grams. So if you've got like big robust teaspoons, just put three of those in your hand. If you've got small, delicate little teaspoons, then add four, okay? So put three or four teaspoons in your hand, depending on, on what you reckon. You're probably holding there about the weight of the heaviest stick insect. Now, when I first did this a couple of weeks ago, I was like, ah, oh, it's a bit boring. I thought it was gonna like really blow their minds how heavy the heaviest stick insect was, but that doesn't weigh very much. If, if you close your eyes though, if you hold your teaspoons out in front of you, and you close your eyes and you imagine that that is an insect sitting on your hand. Very, I was literally just in my kitchen late at night and I was like, ah, <laughs> if you've got a good imagination, 
that's actually really quite strange. That's an insect in your, yeah. So I've got a picture of that one. Heteropteryx dilatatus. Uh, sounds like a dinosaur, but it's not. It's uh, this thing. Look at that. It doesn't really look how we would imagine a stick insect to look, does it? Look at that. I've only just noticed. Look at that. God, that's a brilliant photo, isn't it? These people who just put pictures on Wikimedia Commons for free that anyone can use. So good. Look at the state of that. Um, yeah, so that's the heaviest one. The longest one, that's what the food cans were for. So if you've got six food cans with you, doesn't matter what they are, it doesn't matter if they're full or empty, but if you can stack six food cans on top of each other or lay them down along the floor, that's how long the longest stick insect ever recorded is. Again, maybe not that tall until you think that it's an insect. Um, it's quite a cool story. Um, it was found in China. Locals were telling stories about a nearby stick insect that was ridiculously long, longer than anyone had seen before. And a, a scientist from the Insect Museum in China actually like came and had to kind of hunt it down and did find her. Took her back to the museum in China where she had laid eggs and one of those eggs has hatched into the longest stick insect ever. About 64 centimetres, I think. Um, yes, yeah, so that was that. Right, we should talk a little bit about uh, stick insects in the UK, because most of us are in the UK. Um, they live in the wild here, okay? They were from New Zealand, and then the eggs travelled over on a boat, I think on some food. Um, and also, like, obviously, pets escape and people release their pets. So there's three species of stick insect living in the UK. Um, they, like I say, they, they're from the tropics, so they, they're surviving down south in uh, Cornwall mainly. I, I, I just love this. I love, the, I love how the names relate to the order in which they were found. So this prickly little guy that I'm gonna show you here, this was the first stick insect to be discovered in the UK. What do you think they called it? Look at that. So you think, maybe not what you would be expecting from a stick insect, it was very prickly. What did they call it? Come on, stretch your minds. Three, two, one. They called it the prickly stick insect, that's right. Um, so this one is the second one to be discovered in the UK. And what do you think they called this one? It's not prickly. What's the name of this lass here? <laughs> okay, it's not prickly. It's the second stick insect you've ever found. It's the smooth stick insect. Yep, well done, British people. Um, and there is a third one as well, the unarmed stick insect. Um, yeah, so... We Saying that one of them is called unarmed is a good time to mention. Uh, probably the most disgusting thing I've ever read about in theory of science. You think of stick insects as being sort of quite friendly. Um, they do have ways of scaring off predators. Some of them have got wings that they kind of flash. Some of them have got prickles like spines and they can clamp their legs together and it really hurts. Some of them do this thing called reflex bleeding. Reflex bleeding is a thing. It's not actually blood, but if threatened, they like, it's just stuff, well, I've written it down. Noxious fluid flows out of their pores in their exoskeleton, and it doesn't taste very nice. It doesn't sound very nice either. So yeah, there you go. That's how stick insects defend themselves. Um, I think we've been pretty much ready for story time, except I want to tell you my new favorite word and see if you can guess what this is. What does this word mean? Uh, get a red pen. <coughs> because this is something that stick insects do very well. The new word that I want us all to remember is crypsis. Right, what is crypsis? Well, here's your clues. Um, crypsis is if animals live underground, that's crypsis. If animals only come out at night, if they're nocturnal, that is also crypsis. If animals are camouflaged, that is crypsis and the reason this relates mainly to stick insects is because stick insects sway from side to side. And that's crypsis. Feels like that song. When a stick insect sways from side to side, that's crypsis. But it is. What is crypsis? What is a crypsis? What do you think? Have you got it? Crypsis is, I'm going to write it on the bottom, I'm so excited. Um, it's just a much better word than camouflage because it means avoiding predators in general. How do you spell predators? Predators. Yeah. Never doubt myself for a second. 
Crypsis is just avoiding predators, like camouflage, obviously, making yourself blend into the surroundings is one form of crypsis. Only coming out at night is a good form of crypsis. Um, crypsis is basically, I think, what in my fair house we call ninja skills. Like, if you can get into the kitchen, steal something off the table, like a biscuit, and then get out of the kitchen without anyone noticing, that's crypsis. If you throw a coat over your head when people come into the hallway and they walk past you and they don't notice you, crypsis. Swaying from side to side, like the, uh, <laughs> like the sick insects do, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's crypsis. It's a way of the make, it makes them look more sticky, like a branch swaying in the breeze. Yeah? Crypsis. Come, come on. Every time someone says camouflage from now on, every time you're going to use the word camouflage, I want you to just pause and think, mm -hmm. do I mean camouflage or do I mean crypsis? Right. I, think I, I, I always go much faster on YouTube because there's no one interrupting me with, with wonderful, joyous comments. Uh, they've been in the UK for 100 years. I think, I think it's time for story time. I'm just gonna, oh God. That was not, if you've done my IGCSE lessons on forces, you know that having something like that far away from your head, it's not, it's not comfortable. Okay, yeah, Lego story time. Brilliant, let's do it. <laughs> right. So we've discussed stick insects this show. But apologies, Stick Insects fans, uh, this story is not about them. It does start with their cousins, though. So we looked at how all Stick Insects are in the order Phasmatidae, um, but that order is broken up into different families. And one of those families is, say it with me, Leaf Insects. Yeah. Have you heard of these things? Absolutely beautiful. There they are. Um, there's one green one. And one brown one looking like a dead leaf. Yeah, insects that look like leaves. Stunning. They live in Southeast Asia and Australia. But people in the West found out about leaf insects when they were discovered by an Italian explorer called Antonio Pigafetta. I have to apologise for whether I'm going to pronounce every word in this story. Uh, Pigafetta was in the Philippines in the early 1500s when he met a stick insect, a leaf insect, and this is what he had to say about them. In this island are found certain trees, the leaves of which, when they fall, are animated and walk. Near the leaf stalk they have, on each side, two feet. If they are touched, they escape. But if crushed, they do not give out blood. I kept one for nine days in a box. I believe they live upon air. Now, you might well have listened to that description and think, OK, there's a reason why I haven't heard of Antonio Pigafetta. But keep in mind, everything we know today, all the amazing things we've achieved have all happened because of people thinking and cataloguing, questioning things long before we were born. Antonio Pigafetta is a big part of that. He was part of the Magellan expedition, assisting Ferdinand Magellan on as what, what was, as far as we know, the first ever voyage around the world. About 250 people set off from Spain in 1519, and only about 30 of them completed the journey. Uh, Pigafetta was one of the people who completed the journey, and he was the only person keeping a diary. So really everything we know about this incredible first voyage around the world uh, comes from his writings. Here is a picture of the boat. The ship, I should say. Isn't that gorgeous? That is a replica in a, a museum in Chile. Stunning. Um, so the people on board had one goal. Yeah, but they really did. It was to find a way of getting to the so-called Spice Islands by sailing west. Because uh, the Spice Islands were where all the lovely nutmeg and cloves were. It seems a bit weird to us because we only eat nutmeg probably about twice a year. But at the time it was new, it was great, and they wanted it. Um, and they did indeed achieve their aim. It's uh, Magellan. Here he is. Plop. Magellan was actually the person who named the Pacific Ocean because when their ships arrived in the Pacific Ocean, the water was so calm um, that he called it Pacifico, which means peaceful in Spanish. But things wouldn't stay peaceful for long. 
I said that the goal of Magellan uh, was to sail to the so-called Spice Islands, but of course they weren't there for a holiday. They wanted control. Um, so Magellan met with the leader of one of the islands, Cebu, and before long, uh, the leader and his queen had been uh, baptised into the Catholic faith, been given Christian names, uh, and been given a picture of uh, Jesus. Cool. Um, this alliance meant that all the nearby leaders were told that they had to give food and provisions and supplies to Magellan and his ships, uh, which they did, all except one. The leader, Lapu-Lapu, on the neighbouring island of Mactan, wasn't impressed by his picture of Jesus and refused to obey. Uh, Magellan told Lapu, you know, this isn't on, I'm afraid. If you do not obey the king of Spain, then I'm going to have to attack you. Uh, but Magellan said, nope. So, as the sun... Ro Wait, where's my sun? <clears throat> As the sun rose on the morning of April the 27th, 1521, Magellan and his 50 or so armoured soldiers stepped into the shallow water on the beaches of Mactan. Uh, the leader of Cebu was there, you remember, like the king and queen. He was there with all his forces, uh, but Magellan told them to stay on the ship. We think maybe so that he could kind of show off his men's fighting skills and their cool weapons as they defeated Lapu-Lapu. Um, because they had swords and crossbows and guns, Magellan was feeling very confident. Pigafetta tells us, here he is, um, that about 1,500 warriors fighters uh, met them on the beaches of Lapu-Lapu, the people who lived, at, sorry, on, on Lapu-Lapu's beaches, the people who lived at Mactan. Um, they had metal swords, they had bows, and they had spears. Oh dear. Uh, Wikipedia tells us, I shouldn't be laughing, uh, they say, uh, Magellan, hoping to ease the attack, set fire to uh, some of the houses. Do you think that setting fire to the people of Mactan's houses helped to ease the fighting? Spoiler, no, it didn't. It made the angry people of Mactan even more angry and they charged. So Magellan ordered a retreat, retreat, retreat. But of course, because he ordered the retreat, they then knew that he was the leader and they attacked him. Um, he was got in the leg by a poisoned arrow. So the Magellan expedition did get back to Spain. But unfortunately, they had to do it without Magellan. This is them going home without him. Um, the Battle of Mactan is now famous in the Philippines because it put off the take, their taking over of Spain by about 44 years. Um, and the diary that survived, because um, as I say, Pigafetta was the only one keeping a diary, was written out by hand and sent to all the kings and queens of Europe. Um, on his return, four copies of it still exist in the world. For those who want a reminder of how far science has come and how treating people with respect and avoiding violence is usually the way to go if you want a happy ending. The end. Um, I want to show you this as well, actually, because this is very cool. If you came to last week's lesson on the Mariana Trench, uh, look, this is the Spice Islands on the map. We don't call them that anymore. Um, and look, you recognise that? That's the Mariana Trench, isn't it? How nice is that? Love it when a story time bonds together with another story time. Look how close they are. Isn't that great? We should all go to the Philippines immediately. Look, Challenger Deep. That's exactly where we were last week, and now we're here. Love it. Right, you lot. Um, that is the end of the Stick Insect Show. Thank you so much for coming. Some of you will have been to my Facebook page because every time I'm live on YouTube, there's no comments, but I leave a message on Facebook saying, oh, if you want to say hi, say hi here. So some of you might have said hi, that'd be nice. Um, I'll do my ad because this is my job. So I do need paying for my job. You don't all have to pay me, but enough people are clubbing together to give me five pounds a month that I can actually do this instead of teaching in a school. So if you want to keep uh, me going, keep supporting me, you can go to my uh, about section, take you to this website called Coffee. Come on, Laura, be proactive, write it on the board. Come on, you can do this, you can market yourself. If you go to this website called Caf uh, Coffee, 
Theatre of Science, then uh, yeah, you can sign up to support me with like five or six pounds a month. Someone signed up with ten pounds today. How nice is that? Um, whatever you can afford, except five pounds or more. I will send you Theatre of Science magazine. I write it, my husband graphically designs it, and it's brilliant actually. I'm very proud of it. It's the one thing I do for Theatre of Science that I actually have time to get just right. <laughs> Um, so it will tell you about why the primary colours of paint are not red and blue and yellow. It's got some, um, it's on colour this one, it's my favourite past issue I think on uh, colour. It's a bumper issue, you get some optical illusions, you get a beautiful comic about the artist Monet and how he had a superpower that he didn't really like. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff in Theatre Science magazine, ideas for activities, yeah, I'm very proud of it. And I'll send you some rainbow glasses too because, you know, who doesn't want to look at a white light and see rainbows? Ah, so good. Okay, right, I'll just go to my Facebook page and see if anyone said hello. Um, and then have a nice little chat to you on Facebook, probably. Right, let's have a look. It's the moment of truth. I think I've told you everything that I want to tell you. Smooth ones. Yep, yeah, naturalised. The reflex bleed. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I've done my bit. Let's see what you have to say. So I think Robin is probably watching. Robin, who I've been chatting to for a long time, a uh, long-standing member of the Science Alliance. I knew that he had a pet snake called Hissy. I didn't know he had a stick insect. Oh, look, comments. I wonder if there's more than more than Robin's stick insect watching. Let's have a look. Hey, Barnaby. Oh, hello. Don't know what you're doing on there. Hello, Barnaby. Good to see you. Hello, Grace and Rose. Splendid to see you too. You look brilliant. Thanks, Caroline. <laughs> oh, good. Mariam and Yusuf and Ali Hassan can see me. You're saying that like you couldn't see me now. That's good. You can see me. Excellent. Oh no! You, 17 minutes ago, Soph couldn't find me on YouTube. Have you found me, you lot? Such a silly question. Have you found me? Are you here? I don't know. Oh, Timothy, Noah and Joseph and Julieta are watching. Awesome. Hello. Oh, thanks, Bella. Liking the costume. Oh, and Imogen and Ophelia are having an excellent science day today. Hello, Imogen and Ophelia. Again. Um, yeah, I was a big fan of that story time, actually. I didn't know about that. The first ever voyage around the world. And obviously, it's interesting, isn't it? Because if we lived in the Philippines, we'd have probably learned about the Battle of Mactan at school. This really famous battle. That, like, um, Lapu Lapu is now a, a hero uh, to a lot of people in the Philippines. But yeah, I'd never heard of him. Right, you lot. Uh, that, that's it. I've got nothing more to say about singing text. You should go and enjoy your days. And I will go and enjoy mine. And I'll see you here next week for a show about something else. I don't know what yet. I'm going to go and plan it. I'll see you soon. Bye.